when NASA scientists and exoplanet experts ask us anything about today's announcement of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting TRAPPIST-1. Today, February 22, 2017, NASA announced the first known system of seven Earth-sized planets around a single star. Three of these planets are firmly located in the habitable zone, the area around the parent star where a rocky planet is most likely to have liquid water. This discovery sets a new record for greatest number of habitable zone planets found around a single star outside our solar system. All of these seven planets could have liquid water, key to life as we know it, under the right atmospheric conditions, but the chances are highest with the three in the habitable zone, at about 40 light years. 235 trillion miles from Earth, the system of planets is relatively close to us, in the constellation Aquarius. Because they are located outside of our solar system, these planets are scientifically known as exoplanets. We're a group of experts here to answer your questions about the discovery, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, and our search for life beyond Earth. Please post your questions here, ask us anything. My question is simple. What's next? I mean I'm sure all the excitement of discovering and announcing this find is still fresh but what are the next steps involved in finding out more about this discovery? What information do you think is discoverable about this system in the near future? NASA's Kepler K2 is currently observing TRAPPIST-1. The spacecraft has been monitoring the brightness of the star since the 15th of December, 2016 and will continue to do so until March 04, 2017. That's over 70 days of data. Scientists will be able to define the orbital period of the seventh planet. They may also be able to see a turnover, or reversal, in the transit timing variations which will allow scientists to refine the planet mass estimates. Perhaps we'll even find additional transiting planets. The raw data will be placed in the public archive immediately after the observing campaign finishes. It should be available to community by the 6th of March. This is one of the many ways that scientists will be studying the TRAPPIST-1 system. Natalie Batalha, Kepler Project Scientist. What is the protocol if you do find any signs of life on any of the exoplanets? We do not yet have a protocol. Most likely we will make a tentative discovery. That will take longer to confirm. In order to give context for the lay people out there, if we had the same intelligence and instruments, what would we know about Earth if we looked from a TRAPPIST exoplanet? The next generation of space telescopes, after WFIRST and JWST, to be launched in the 2030s, would be capable of actually getting a spectrum of the Earth, separate from the Sun, using an instrument called a coronagraph or a starshade. The current telescopes could measure the size of the Earth as it transits in front of the Sun. However, that only happens only once per year, so you have to know when to look, or look for a long time. The latter strategy was adopted by the original Kepler mission, Michael Werner. How stable is the planet configuration of the system? Has it reached a stability over long time scales like our solar system has? Or is it a relatively young system where we would expect the bodies to still coalesce into larger objects over time? The stability of the system is still unclear, because it is a complex dynamical system. The planet's masses are not yet precisely determined. We don't know yet the orbital period of the seventh planet, and there could be more planets. More on this soon. Great presentation everyone. When how will you be able to determine if there are signs of an oxygen rich atmosphere? There was a lot of speculation before the conference that you may have already detected that. It's going to be a while before we find an oxygen rich atmosphere. JWST launch in fall 2018. So we will have to wait to try until sometime after that. It turns out some oxygen rich atmospheres might exist that are not created by life. So to associate oxygen will require care. But I hope we will be able to find, identify, and announce in a few years. How long would it take with current technology to get to this solar system? Assuming it's a good few hundred years, what is the next step in finding out what's going on there? If we reach the same 165,000 miles per hour that one probe reached by slingshotting by Jupiter, I think it'll take about 160,000 years or so. Hello, and congratulations and thank you for this discovery. You people are doing amazing work. I have two questions for you. 1. Do we know what kind of a gravity compared to Earth or Mars appears on those three planets that could have water in them? 
2. Can we expect to have the technology in the next 20-30 years that we could foresee for sure that there would be life at those planets in form of vegetation? To answer your second question, in order to see vegetation and any other surface features, for example, oceans, continents, we'll need future telescopes beyond JWST that will be able to directly image exoplanets. JWST will observe planets transiting their host stars. Transits are when the planet passes between us and its star, and from these transits, we can observe how gases in the planet's atmosphere interact with starlight passing through the atmosphere. Unfortunately, this technique doesn't allow us to see the surfaces of exoplanets. To do that, we'll need farther future technology that may become available in the coming decades that will allow us to block out the star's light and observe the planets directly. Examples of these technologies are starlight suppression tools called coronagraphs and starshades. The planets we observe directly with these starlight suppression techniques will not be spatially resolved, there will literally be single points of light. But don't despair because we can still learn a lot from single points of light. By analyzing the spectrum of colors in these points of light, we can search for signs of interesting gases, like water vapor and gases produced by life called biosignatures. And we can look for temporal changes in the light caused by processes like planetary rotation and seasonal variations. However, the Trappist-1 planets, being so close to their host star, would likely be tricky to directly observe in this way. These starlight suppression technologies fail once you get too close to the star and so these types of observations would be extremely difficult. Other planetary systems orbiting hotter stars may be detectable with these technologies, though, and on them, we'd be able to search for things like vegetation and other interesting signs of habitability and life. If life is discovered on any of these exoplanets, how long would it probably take from time of discovery to an actual announcement to the public? Would that time differ depending on the types of life found? Would it take longer to disclose sentient beings than it would to disclose microbial life? That is a great question and something that has been thought about a lot by many different organizations. There is a great article on this by SETI scientist Dr. Duncan Forger which looks at many different scenarios in the age of 24 hour news and social media. What are the most promising ways to search a planet that far away for life, assuming it is not intelligent enough to broadcast signals outward? We will look at the atmosphere for gases that do not belong, gases that might be attributed to life. We will not know if the gases are produced by microbial life or by intelligent alien species. Does TRAPPIST-1 itself pose any hazards to the planets like radiation or flares? TRAPPIST-1 shows one flare, eruption, every week and a strong one every six months. Its X-ray activity is not yet very well known and could be also a threat for any life there. But if the planets have an atmosphere and magnetic field this could limit the level of high energy flux. This is still work under investigation to estimate those levels. What would be the temperatures on each of these planets in the most likely chemical compositions? Are they likely to have a magnetic field? Surface temperatures depend on the proximity to the central star but also on the composition and thickness of the planet's atmosphere. Since we do not yet know anything about the planetary atmospheres, all we can say is how much energy a planet is receiving from the star compared to how much energy Earth receives from the Sun. However, because this planetary system is so nearby, scientists should be able to characterize the atmospheres with future instruments and observatories. That's one reason why we're so excited about this discovery. Any chance we could name these planets after the seven dwarfs? That would be a lovely idea. With the Trappist team, we were more considering using names of the few Trappist beers. Hey guys, love this discovery. I got chills when I saw the headline. My question is regarding the orbits of these planets. How exactly do y'all think the planet's gravity is affecting the other planets? If the innermost planets are tightly locked, would they get slightly disrupted by passing other planets? Are their orbits not entirely elliptic? Could they be slightly wavy due to other planets' gravitational pulls? So glad we can finally share the chills. The planet's gravity is affecting each other and leading to what we call transit timing variations, TTVs, which is at the basis of how we can estimate the masses of the Trappist-1 planets. When planets are close together and their orbits are in a certain spacing, they interact with each other through gravity, causing the timing of their transits to change a little as the planets tug on each other. 
By measuring this change, we can determine the mass of the planets. By knowing precisely the size and mass of the planets, we can determine their bulk density, and geophysicists can then help us better understand their interiors. Then next to this, there will most likely be some tidal heating and significant tides on the planets that would be water worlds. The constraints on the orbital eccentricity of the planets are a work in progress and the amplitude of the effects described above will depend strongly on those. So let's see, it is really just the beginning for the exploration of this system. Spitzer helped us lift the fail on its architecture, now we can initiate its characterization, the venture for the generation to come. What information will you guys receive from these planets if the James Webb Telescope is ready and functional? NASA's upcoming James Webb Telescope, launching in 2018, will take over with a much higher sensitivity. It will be able to detect the chemical fingerprints of water, methane, oxygen, ozone, and other components of a planet's atmosphere. How is the habitable zone estimated for tightly locked planets? How does knowledge of this system affect theories of planetary formation? The habitable zone is estimated based on the luminosity of the star and recognizing how far away can you be from it such that water can exist in its liquid form on the surface of a terrestrial planet like the Earth. Too close and the water evaporates, too far and the water freezes solid. Thus, the habitable zone is independent of whether the planets are tightly locked or not. What are the primary impacts of being an Earth-sized world so close to a smaller, dimmer star? From the perspective of a human on the surface of such a world, I mean, I read that all are tightly locked to the star, does that mean they'd only have habitability bands around the perimeter twilight region? Tidal locking, we think as long as there is an atmosphere, even a thin atmosphere like that on Mars, heat will circulate around the planet, so habitability location should extend beyond the limbs. Do we know the age of the system and planets? Not precisely because such little stars evolve very 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 slowly they live for hundreds of billions years compared to 10 billions for our own sun. We can say that it is older than 500 million years, but it could be several billions years and even older than our own system. Hi, and congrats on the amazing discovery. Although I'm aware we can't see the Trappist 1 star, where in the night sky would it be if we could see it? Aquarius is visible in the night sky in October. How long have NASA known about the discovery? What is really important about these types of discoveries is that they are checked by other scientists and confirmed external to the original team. This is called the peer review process and has to occur before any scientific work is made public. To make sure we are giving the best information available. How can a young aspiring astronomer like myself get involved in this kind of work? At my university it seems like undergrads get funneled directly into academia. What does it take to work at an institution like NASA? I've already started getting involved in research as a sophomore, and my dream research topic is exoplanets. There are many possibilities. You can log into the NASA Planet Quest site and see tools and databases about the planets as they are discovered. Try logging into eyes on exoplanets, JPL. Goddard, and other NASA centers have summer internships and lots going on in the world of exoplanets. This would be a good way for you to get some first-hand experience. Most NASA scientists like myself have PhDs but have chosen to work for NASA rather than in universities. You could start in a PhD program, possibly doing your research in direct conjunction with NASA, or working for a professor like Sarah Seeger who does lots of NASA-funded work on exoplanets. Following that, Try for a postdoctoral position at a NASA center. Many good postdocs go on to become regular NASA employees. I appreciate your interest. For the 9-12 year olds in my class, what space futures might these kids look forward to? What will we need from their generation of kids to make these space dreams possible in the future? It's an exciting time to be a kid, and to be an explorer. If students out there are interested in joining us here at NASA, taking as much math as possible is always good. That said, it's also important to study language arts, too, so that you can communicate your discoveries and innovations. For the future of exoplanet research, would it be more fruitful in your opinion to continue looking at different batches of stars for more planets, or would you rather we focus more closely on the planets that have already been found? Actually, we're going to do both. 
Certainly scientists will use tools like the Hubble Space Telescope and soon the James Webb Space Telescope to study the planets that have already been discovered in an effort to learn more about them. At the same time, the Kepler K2 mission and soon the TESS mission will continue the search for new planets, particularly those in our neighborhood of the galaxy. When the JWST is launched, how will it be used to analyze this system? What will it be looking for, and what will it be able to tell us about these planets? We'll want to search for signs of interesting gases in the atmospheres of these planets with JWST. A high priority gas we of course want to detect is water vapor since water is necessary for life as we know it and is a fundamental part of our definition of planetary habitability. We will need to stare at these targets for a long time with JWST to be able to collect sufficient signal from them for a chance at determining their atmospheric compositions. During transit events, when the planets pass in front of their star, gases in the planet's atmospheres can absorb starlight, producing potentially detectable signals. These will be very difficult observations, however, and obtaining better constraints on these planets' properties beforehand, for example, their masses, can help disentangle the signals we obtain with JWST in the future. Hello from the Edge. My question is about the host star. I read that red dwarf stars are likely to eject a lot of solar particles therefore the habitability of planets around this kind of stars is less. What about Trappist-1? The stellar winds of ultra-cool dwarf stars like Trappist-1 are significantly fainter than for more massive red dwarfs, because their atmospheres is cooler and thus less charged. Still, habitable conditions on the planets require them to have magnetic fields to protect the atmospheres from these stellar winds. We don't know if they have. If we detect dense atmospheres, this will make planetary magnetospheres very likely. Which one of the new discoveries is the one your team is most excited about? The three planets E, F and G are the so-called habitable zone and are the best candidates to harbor liquid water and, maybe, life. How can you know that existing life are in need of liquid water? We don't know anything about extraterrestrial life, do we? Just because we breathe oxygen and are dependent on water, does that mean that all other potential life have the same criteria? Very true. We have a very Earth-centric perspective on life and habitability. But this is the beauty of exoplanetary science. We are exploring other worlds, finding unexpected planet types, for example, hot Jupiter, Super Earths, planets around completely different types of stars. All this is helping us broadening our perspective on planetary systems, which was based on a century-long study of our own system. Now, let's hope exoplanetary science will provide us with a similar perspective shift on habitability and life in the universe. You have been visited by the strong skeleton he wants you to like this video and have a good week. Thanks for watching. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.